And going in chronological order, I'll start with Stanley Mouse. So Stanley. Hi. Hi. Your father was a Disney animator, and you got your start airbrushing t-shirts at hot rod shows. Can you tell us a little bit about how that background fit into your early work as a poster artist? That's a big story. <laughs> yeah, it's a big story. But give us just, um, well. <laughs> I, I guess I grew up, grew up around the a dinner table sketching with my dad. And, uh, and then uh, uh, in high school, I, I guess there was a big fad going on of, with uh, hot rods. Of course, I was in Detroit. And it was also happening in Los Angeles. But it was a, a big fad of uh, airbrushing on, on sweatshirts with hot rods and monsters. And there was a big monster fad at, in that, those days, too. And, so I, I tried it, and everybody forced all you know all, all the kids in the neighborhood had their T-shirts, saying "Paint, paint mine," and uh, I was off and running, and then uh, I painted. It must have painted like ten thousand T-shirts or sweatshirts uh, in the next uh, eight or eight or nine years, and after. Uh, uh, painting so many, uh, and I think I think it, I went to art school during the week, and then I painted at hot rod shows at, on the weekends around the country. And, and uh, art school was was the, I liked the life drawing class. I was I was good at that, and the life drawings was from the human body, and so it gave. That's where I learned like the Art, art Nouveau lines, because the human body has Art Nouveau lines. And um, uh, after about eight, nine years of painting a million shirts, and, and I would, people would p like put a picture of their sister or their, or their kitty cat or their, their 55 Chevy or, or whatever, they'd put it in front of me and I'd have to draw it on a, on a, on a sweatshirt. Or a T-shirt, and uh, so I—that was my real art school training. I became—I was able to draw just about anything. And uh, uh, after about eight years, I, I got bored with it, and and uh, then psychedelics pot came along, and psychedelics, and and that opened up a whole whole giant world. And I think it was especially good for me because I was already, my skills were already totally at the, the top, you know, was, how do you say it? My skills were really keen. And, uh, and then when I started, like, messing with psychedelics, a giant world opened up and, and uh, uh, I got a chance to... Uh, go to California. I heard things were happening in, Calif in San Francisco. And so me and some friends, we all ventured out here. And it happened that they were doing posters. And I said, I can do that. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that. How did you first stumble onto the poster scene? How did you get involved in that? Well, I came, first came out in 65 and uh, I, me and my girlfriend stayed in a little windmill in, in Berkeley. It's actually still there. It's like, oh, uh, uh, it's on, uh, I can't remember, 51st Street in uh, the street that goes through Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we, we stayed there for, for, uh, uh, the, a summer, a really delightful summer, and I would airbrush T-shirts in the in the front of the place, and and uh, we got introduced to the the San Francisco scene. We would go over to San Francisco and meet. I had a lot of friends that came from Detroit, and we would like Jim Gurley, who was the lead guitarist in Big Brother, 
and he introduced me to Kelly. And uh, then I got drafted, went back to Detroit to face the draft board, and uh, I uh, took a lot of LSD, and they kicked me out. Good, good move. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in Detroit, you could get these these cars because they made them there. They had to get them out to different parts of the country, and so they called them driveaways. And I called and I said, "Do you have a driveway?" And I was wanted to go back to San Francisco, and, and they said, "All we have is a is a Cadillac hearse." And I said, "Perfect." <laughs> and so I put a "Make Love Not War" sticker on the back. The Vietnam, of course, was raging at the time. And um, dr put my girlfriend and, and the dog and all my supplies back in the hearse and drove to San Francisco. And we got here for the night of the acid trips, but we were too tired to go in. We were drove straight through. And, um, and then I, I, I actually came out the original, Originally, in a, in a, a little Porsche, <laughs> it was like a brand new Porsche because I was making a lot of money painting T-shirts, and I bought it. Actually, it was 1965. I bought a brand new Porsche for $3,500. Wow! <laughs> and I drove it here, and then I left it here when I went back to Detroit for the draft board. But when I got back, I, it had a broken axle, and I heard Kelly was a good mechanic, and so he came over to try to fix fix the broken axle. And uh, so we got to be friends, and and uh, uh, and then he became he never fixed the Porsche. I had to get to, <laughs> I had to take it somewhere else. But we uh, he became the art director of the family dog uh, posters. So um, he brought Chad Helms over to my st studio and uh, uh, introduced me and. He gave me a poster. Chet said, what kind of art do you do? And I said, oh, kind of like some cartoons. He says, we don't want no cartoons. <laughs> and that really stuck in my head. I think for years after that, I could hear him saying that. Because everybody else went into cartoons after the posters, and I didn't. So. And that was your start with, with Chet. How did you come to do work for Bill? Uh, Bill Graham. I'm not sure, but I think it was because I was doing posters. He he asked me, and he was kind of friendly mm -hmm. to the artists, and and people I knew knew him, and we all talked. And somewhere along in there, you moved to the city, to San Francisco. And one of the interesting things you've talked about in other interviews is your proximity to the Bindweed Press. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that friendship, that collaboration, and how that fed, uh, fed into your art. Yeah, I, when we moved to San Francisco, um, when I came back, uh, I lived on 17th Street up going up the hill, and uh, next door was an apartment building, and I kept seeing this pretty blonde lady walk, walk in and out all the time, and this crazy guy with, with all this hair and stuff. And um, and then my landlord said he wanted to move in the house, and I, he was a real estate agent. And I said, you have, you have to get me somewhere to live be, he said, he, before I move out. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want a firehouse. So within two days, he came up with a firehouse on, on Henry Street, Henry and Noe, which is near the, the Haight-Ashbury. And um, so I moved in there. Started doing posters with Kelly there, and I I think the the Grateful Dead one came out, and Ida was the Rick Griffin's wife. Ida was the blonde lady going inside the apartment. I guess she was they were in, they were separated or something at the time, and uh, uh, she sent out one of those to Rick, and Rick uh, made a beeline to San Francisco and joined the fray. And the guy with the crazy hair was Bob Siderman, the, the, the photographer that took our, all our pictures. Such a small community. 
But being close to bindweed, did that give you, how did that shape your art? How did that, you, you've mentioned in other interviews that it, it meant a lot to you to be able to just walk over and communicate right. with the printer. Yeah, the firehouse was uh, on Henry Street, and around the corner on Noe Street was the printer. I think the back, both of our buildings backed up to each other in back. But uh, I could take over the artwork to him, and he would print it. And I could watch him, watch him printing, printing it. He also collected uh, pump organs. And uh, one night, it was actually a warm San Francisco night, and he had the door open. And uh, I had just eaten some mescaline, I think. And I went over there, and I think it was the girl with green hair poster was being printed. And the printing press has this beautiful rhythm to it, clickety, clickety, clickety. And so I, I started playing the pump organ and, and to the rhythm of the printing press and watching the, the colors come out of the printing press. It was an amazing, amazing evening. It's a great image. That really is. That's a movie right there. Yeah. Uh, and right along at, at that time, you and we're sitting in the, the basement of the, uh, the San Francisco Public Library, where you and Alton Kelly would often spend afternoons looking for images and looking for the perfect illustration for posters. Tell us a little bit about that and one of the more famous images that came from that exploration. Yeah, we, would, um, uh, we, were, we were hungry to, to, to find out about old posters and, and you know classic old posters. And so we weren't far from the library, so we'd go uh, and they, they upstairs is the, what I think they call it the stacks where you can't you can't uh, take books out, but uh, you could look at them there. So we would we would be going through books, book after book, you know, getting a great education on on uh, poster art, it's things we never saw like Gustav Klimt and Alphonse, Alphonse Mucha, and, and uh, we had a j job to do. A Grateful Dead poster. Of course, the Grateful Dead wasn't just one of the other one of the bands playing, and they weren't gods like they are now. But um, we were looking for something that said kind of said Grateful Dead, and um, came across this uh, this picture in the Rubiot uh, Rubiot of Omar Khayyam, and it, it was the skeleton roses, and we looked at it and said, that says Grateful Dead all over it, and so, I don't know if I should say this, but I used to say that uh, we Xeroxed it, but um, they didn't have Xeroxes back then, yeah. but uh, I realized that Kelly had cut it out of the book. <laughs> I think the statute of limitations has now passed upon that. <laughs> Plus, Kelly's not around anymore. Anyway. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't do it. <laughs> there was. I have this picture with, of this pope that they 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 took out of the grave and and put him in a chair and and they they did a court case against him. Oh sure. That'd be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we've we've got the next uh, the next idea brewing already. <laughs> we could make a poster for it. When. You've said that Grateful technology dead. has had both positive and negative effects on the art of posters, that for every step forward, uh, we've also lost something. And I was just wondering if you care to elaborate on that. Say that again. You said before that every, every sort of advance in technology surrounding the production of posters has been both a step forward, but that we've also lost something in that process. And this is my last question for you before we move on. So I sort of wanted to give you the, the open-ended chance to tell us a little bit about what you, how you see that. Yeah, I keep looking for, for a printing company that has a one-color printing press. So I could print like we printed back then because it seemed to be more of an art. It's like, a, like the silk screen thing that they're doing out there. Because sometimes they're a little off register and and uh, I don't know they just look artsier now then and now it, the, the printing presses print four colors at a time and it comes out looking like a like a magazine cover 
and uh, I, I try to fake it, you know, like maybe make some out, things out of register, <laughs> but it still it doesn't have the art to it that it used to. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a, that's a perfect point of, of segue to our next speaker, Winston Smith. And Winston developed his art at a time when that was still very much a challenge. And so, Winston, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about our, your background and how you became interested in rock art. Well, I owe a, a great debt of gratitude to Stanley's work and the work of uh, his associates because as a teenager in the 1960s, I would see you know, psychedelic posters and, and um, uh, at head shops and, <laughs> and other other places. I lived in, of all places, Oklahoma, which is about as far away as you can get from anything that was happening. <laughs> and um, uh, so to see these works was like an, uh, you know, a, an atomic bomb to the brain uh, to know that, that these assemblages could be possible, especially uh, the lettering in psychedelic posters that was so wild and uh, contorted, and, um, and sometimes you, you actually had to be kind of stoned to actually read it, <laughs> because you could look at it, and I'm, uh, I was saying before, I'm a bit dyslexic, so already it's hard for me to read normal words, but those words I could read because they flowed the way that I would already think, and uh, uh, I was thinking, you know, as a kid, finally, someone who thinks like me, <laughs> this is <laughs> not the oddball anymore. And um, so that was a big uh, inspiration. And I was fortunate that my, my mom was an artist. When, when she was a teenager before the war, she was a sculptress and a painter. And so our, our house was filled with art books. And we had Albrecht Dürer and uh, uh, Raffaello and Leonardo and uh, uh, all these works of classical uh, art that uh, I'd pour over. Uh, and I thought everybody knew about these pictures. And, and um, so on, uh, I've done my part to, um, what's the word, to disconstruct, deconstruct mm -hmm. some of them over the years, um, only out of reverence for the originals, but I'm sure probably annoys people who like, you know, uh, uh, purity and originalism and, and no change. Uh, but things do change over time, and we all contribute to them. And um, uh, so that that was a big advantage, I think, as an artist to have this my own reference library, essentially. Um, although I couldn't uh, cut any pictures out, I think I would have been skinned alive. You know, my, my mom. Uh, I. Although I do recall one time going to McDonald's bookshop, which is down in the Tenderloin, it's gone now, but it was a vast old place with uh, rickety staircases and found the exact right picture that I needed in an old Life magazine. Went to ask the guy how much it was. It was more than I had on me. I said, oh, okay, I'll put it back. And I go back upstairs and you know, always carried a little razor blade on me and just <laughs> like slipped it out. And that became the centerpiece for um, a Dead Kennedys uh, record. Uh, it was just the right picture. And, oh, I'll be back next week. I'll get it. You know, thank you, sir. Uh, I unfortunately never was good for my word at that point. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how uh, my inspiration was probably being the fact that I was saturated with artwork and never had any other uh, marketable skills to uh, sell, you know, um, uh, uh, so I had to be an artist by default. You were destined for it. I had no choice. How did you get from Oklahoma to San Francisco and get involved in the burgeoning punk scene? Really long, uh, long I went the wrong way around the planet. To, when I was about 17, I was going to, it occurred to me, you didn't have to graduate from high school to go to college. And I thought, then what am I doing here? <laughs> because I hated school, I was a bad student all my life. And I think I was in 10th uh, grade, whatever, 16, 17. I was going to go to the Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, my folks had, were Yankees, they came from the north from Chicago. And I um, found out that that was pretty expensive and 
that didn't happen. I didn't have good enough grades to get in, so I couldn't afford to go. Um, by sheer dumb luck, some friend of the family knew some people. Uh, I had saved up some money to go to, to Ireland. My family was Irish. And at that time, you could, uh, the very late 60s, you could get round trip tickets from New York to either London or Rome or Paris for like $199. That was like a thing for about three or four years until they wised up and raised the price. But that's when backpackers were all over Europe it, because you couldn't afford not to go for 200 bucks. And um, it was an open-ended, year-long ticket. And now, you know, it would never happen. Um, so I took advantage of that. And, but then it dawned on me I'd get to Ireland, wouldn't have enough money to get off the bus, <laughs> turn around and go back. So these uh, friends were saying, hey, you know, if your kid can uh, go to Rome instead, we have friends you can crash with in, you know, in Florence or in Rome, and, and that would be better than nothing. At that point, I really didn't know where Italy was on the map. I, I am geographically dyslexic, so I couldn't. Um, I figured, well, that's better than nothing. I'll, I'll do that. And found out that it was cheaper to go to the Art Institute, the, uh, the um, uh, School of Fine Arts um, and the university there than it was to go to school, even in Oklahoma. Because Italy at that time was the cheapest country in the in Europe. Uh, a bus ride was a nickel. Uh, a bottle of wine was fifty cents. Uh, my rent was about forty dollars in the middle of you know the center of the city. Um, so it would be like going back in time to like nineteen twenty two. You know when your grandfather said, "Ah, I could get a whole meal for a quarter," and that's kind of how it was. It was a whole meal for a dollar, uh, but. Um, uh, now, unfortunately, because of inflation, it's completely the opposite, and it's the most expensive country in the in Europe. But uh, oh, that's a piece. The guy in the middle, that he was torn out of a <laughs> a, a magazine I couldn't afford. Um, <laughs> he's screaming. At the, it was a perfect uh, face. Um, but I wound up staying there for like six or seven years, and came back to America. I left in the nineteen. 60s and came back in the mid 1970s and when I got back everything in society had changed you know the riding in the streets was over with people were kind of like dummy down watching television and nobody was into any ecological or environmental or political change all that had been kind of subdued or bought off and uh, I I remember just feeling outraged that this change had happened you know behind my back because I hadn't been back for years and and um, wound up living in Boston for a little bit, but then hitchhiked across the country to get to uh, San Francisco exactly 40 years ago last week um, on St. Patrick's Day of all days. So it's kind of like your arrival in San Francisco on the night of the acid trips and you know, perfect timing. Um, so uh, um, that, Led you know one thing led to another. I was a, had been a roadie for some uh, jazz bands back in Italy, so the only thing I knew how to do was carrying sound equipment, um, and I got a job working at SIR, which was a um, studio rental joint. They'd rent equipment and things for bands. And we had every day in the studios we had Journey and Santana and Crosby, Sills and Nash and a bunch of local bands, but then like some international bands would come through the tubes, and, uh, 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 which had really peculiar equipment to have to carry, <laughs> usually paper mache uh, 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 rocket ships and, and uh, baby dolls and uh, strange, uh, but great band. White Punk's on Dope mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> um, Big Hit. So then a year or two, two years later, the punk rock scene was rearing its ugly head in in San Francisco and all over in LA and New York. But here it was because San Francisco is such a small city, physically small, it's only mm -hmm. seven miles across. And it's like an island, really, it's, it's surrounded by water. So it's a walking town, people walk around, they see posters. It's not like they just drive you know, LA and everywhere else, it's automobiles. So posters were everywhere. 
coffee shops on walls, you know, you couldn't walk anywhere without seeing some really crazy screwball posters for bands and gigs. And, and sometimes posters weren't for anything. They weren't for any event. They were just weird Dada. Um, there was kind of a revival of the Dada trip at that point. And, and, and uh, some of them were great. They're magnificent. Some are pretty lame. And I remember thinking, well, I could probably do that. You know, it was the same <laughs> thing you were saying. Stanley was saying, uh, no, that, I, that's probably something I could pull off. And um, I wound up doing a bunch of uh, posters for bands that didn't exist. I just made them up. I made up, you know, crazy names that then by and by I found out there were bands that took that name, not because of my poster, but it was an obvious, you know, punk rock name. Um, and I put an address for a club that didn't exist. And I found out later on some people were really uh, not happy because they had <laughs> taken a bus to go out to some address that didn't exist and there was a vacant lot. And I said, oh man, we, that really bummed our whole trip. We had to go out there in the middle of the night and we couldn't get back. And uh, it, it was only done to, uh, you know, as a kind of a data experiment. But that way, other bands would see them and go, oh, hey, can you do a, a thing for our band? And, and uh, it was kind of like a fake resume. Mm -hmm. You know, if I said I went to Juilliard, you know, and said, oh, well, then could you write this uh, song we need for the our new movie? Um, but so it was kind of like a, a prank that turned into a career <laughs> uh, such as it is. Um, and that's why I'm here now. If the function of art is to provoke, you did a great job of provocation. Yeah. Tell, us, uh, tell us how you came to, to work specifically with the Dead Kennedys. Well, one thing that I have learned, one of the few things I've learned over the many years, is um, an advice that uh, young people especially will ask me about, you know, as an artist, how do you get into this or that? Uh, because I didn't know anybody in the scene. I just was there, you know. And um, is to volunteer. And it's good for everyone. I mean no matter what age group or demographic you're in, volunteering is good because it takes you out of what you normally would be doing and you're connected with other people, uh, you know, like-minded or, or, or even not like-minded. Maybe that's better and more challenging. And um, I recall being in Recycled Records one time on Grant Avenue and seeing a um, poster in the back that said, we need artists and writers and stagehands for... Uh, punk shows that were going to do Rock Against Racism. It was an um, organization, I think it started in Great Britain, but there was like uh, branches of it here. And um, we put on several shows at the old Temple Beautifuls. And it was a, a beautiful old synagogue, 19th century synagogue on, right near the Fillmore, I guess, um, right mm -hmm. next to uh, Fillmore and Geary. Mm -hmm. Very elaborate and beautiful, and everyone had great respect for it. They didn't tear it up. It was really nice. The, the punks are really polite, you know, and uh, uh, great shows. And by and by, I did more posters for different bands. And a friend of mine in RAR said, "Oh, you've got to meet this friend of mine who thinks just like you. Uh, you guys would, would really hit it off." And I. I thought, well, he may, must be crazy if he thinks like me. And I, I kind of delayed in, in doing that and put it off. I'm, I'm a very good procrastinator. And uh, finally, she was um, instrumental in introducing me to Biafra backstage at the end of a show at the Mabuhe Gardens one time, I think around either Christmas in 1979 or just you know after New Year's of 1980. And we went out looking for places to eat at three or four o'clock in the morning, which uh, weren't too many. I think we wound up at Clown Alley, uh, which used to be you know, open till mm -hmm. 4 a.m. or all night. Um, and Biafra's going through a portfolio of some things of mine, and I had this cross of dollars image um, that I'd made a few years before, and he said, that, that's what I want on my next record. And um, he hadn't even done the first record yet because we uh, were so uh, we wound up working together on the first one called Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. It was kind of brown, groundbreaking. But we made a poster for that. I mean, we made a, a giant poster that was double-sided. 
we crammed in everything we could. You know, it was, uh, it was we, we, we crammed in everything we could because we never thought we'd have another chance. So we just put all this weird stuff. Some of it wasn't very artistically inspired. Uh, it was just, uh, uh, you know, um, artistically verbose. And um, turns out people liked it a lot. And there was another record. And, and by and by, we kept on you know, working together on different projects and posters and um, have been partners in crime ever since. That's great. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, one thing I want, my last question for you before we, we move on to Chris is you're actually longtime friends with Chris and you and Chris and Chuck Sperry took, uh, made a tour of Europe in the early 2000s. And I wanted to ask you how you saw your work, you've made wonderful reference to European and American art traditions. And I just wanted to ask you how that tour shaped your sense of how your art fit into the, did it shape the way you, you imagine your art fitting into those traditions? What, what impact did the tour have? And what's your larger sense of, of allegiance and tradition? It was a, a special, um, it was an interesting tour. It started off in Switzerland. We were in, what was the town? Well, Geneva. Geneva. Yeah. And um, beautiful old uh, 19th century villa that had been abandoned and got squatted by some punks. And um, we each had our own rooms. And uh, a couple of them were haunted, actually, <laughs> according to Chuck. And um, 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 lovely people who uh, hosted us there. And we, um, we had a spectacular location where that show was down by the river. And, and I don't know Geneva very well, but I was only there that one time. Uh, it's mainly all banks, you know, in Switzerland. Banks and chocolate factories, I guess, and cuckoo clocks. Um, but then we went on to Italy, and we were in uh, several towns in Torino, Milano, and... Uh, um, Rome. In Roma, we went, uh, I don't think we, oh, we, some of us went to Florence, but, but I think uh, by that time we had uh, broken up to regroup in, in Rome at uh, the Forte Prenestino. And, um, and Biafra was long for the ride through the Italian arm of the trip, which was um, a bit of an ordeal. He's a lovely guy, uh, a little hard to travel with. You, they say you never get to know someone until you've traveled with them. And uh, uh, um, the um, tour manager was long suffering, uh, but, but he, to put it mildly, uh, but uh, it was a rollicking good time and, uh, Chuck and Ron and Chris and, and I was like the four stooges. Uh, um, we all had to crash in the same rooms, and we had uh, different tenors of snoring. So it was almost like working a pipe organ, you know, you know, the, the three stooges routine, like the Marx Brothers. Um, but we um, uh, uh, people were clamoring uh, for Chris's work and the work of the firehouse guys. Uh, fondly known as the, the knuckleheads, uh, uh, Ron and Chuck. And uh, my work was a little different because it was, um, you know, I had used my collages to reproduce them. I, I used color Xeroxes and color copiers. So I was kind of going into the next generation of, I, silk screen is too technologically challenging for me, <laughs> too, uh, too high tech to figure out. Um, but we did have one evening, I think, in Torino, and Biafra was doing his rap, a spoken word rap. And it was all in English, and probably only about 10% of the people really understood high school English, but they were there because it was a fun show. And I think they had a band, a couple of different shows uh, we did. But in Torino, I think it's where there was a woman who was yakking, and she was yakking in some language we didn't know, and, and they, you know, they were saying, well, what is she saying? Because I speak Italian. I said, I don't know, but it's not Italian. It was, and she was yakking all through Biafra's rap. And he was like, you know, lady, would you be quiet so I can finish my performance? And um, finally, one of the people traveling with us was a journalist for one of the Italian mainstream papers and asked the lady, what do you, what do you say? What language is that? And she said, I'm... Uh, 
I'm speaking the, the, the word of God or the language of God, and, and, uh, uh, and she was channeling the Lord, you know, and, and um, you know, speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so our friend was saying, oh, oh that's interesting. Well, what does God say about Biafra's show? And, and oh, he didn't care about Biafra's show. It's all these, uh, this artwork that, that's being projected behind him. Which was my pictures in a in a uh, um, what do they call it carousel carousel projector old school and um, wow. when Biafra got told the story afterward he was annoyed that God wasn't uh, an, you know he would overlooked him for criticized my pictures you know, they, sh they shouldn't be here they were all wrong they're bad pictures and, and so we we figured we should hire her you know and actually take her to all the shows she could have been like a a, a crowd you know a crowd pleaser. Um, attention getter. Atten exactly, like a barker, you know, at the, at the carnival. Um, but we had a wonderful time, and it was great to see the, the people's um, um, uh, interests in American posters and rock posters in general. And we knew we were appreciated because in Rome we got some of them stolen. Oh, yeah. Because you know you're, you must be doing something right if people are, are going to risk stealing it. Uh, the theft is the highest form of flattery, and, which is exactly what we do. We kind of you know, rip off other people's artwork and then reassemble it. So it is emerging as a theme on the panel, too. Right. So this is good. This it's is only because we admire it. I'll do it. You know? <laughs> well, thank you. That's wonderful. And that's a great note of transition to our last speaker, who is Chris Shaw. And Chris would like to start you off the same way we started these other two fine gentlemen off with, which is tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a poster artist. Yeah, um, well, my mother's an artist, and I always, I always grew up around art. She's a ceramic artist, so I was, you know, always playing with clay and stuff when my mom would throw me in the corner of the studio and tell me to do something and keep occupied. But... Um, I was maybe more naturally a drawer. I've always been a drawer. I just draw stuff, and and uh, I've I've been always kind of interested in iconography and really strong images uh, since I was a real little kid, and um, would actually make um, logos and full graphics packages for my my little you know neighborhood forts and uh, we had stationery and the whole thing so I, I, I had this this kind of thing r running in me a long time um, but uh, it, it's funny uh, Winston was was uh, tipping the hat to Stanley and I have to tip the hat to Winston because I was one of these guys that bought the dead Kennedys fresh fruit for rotten out uh, vegetables albums and pulled it out and I was like oh my god there's so much stuff in this album and there's 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 artwork there's posters and and and, and music and collage and music of course <laughs> obviously um and something clicked with me is that I wanted to do that and I could see myself making collages and making posters and I was super into the music and I was super into the band um as well, and uh, so I became the guy that was making a lot of flyers with Xerox, which was affordable in the early 80s, suddenly, um, uh, for all my friends' bands, you know? Um, so they were, they were the kids in the back of the class that were, you know, practicing their drumming, and I was the guy in the back of the class that was uh, sketching, and we kind of found a happy synthesis. Um, and uh, anyway, that's kind of it. Uh, some of those guys ended up, uh, you know, going on to fame and fortune, and a lot of them didn't. And uh, but uh, in the middle of it, I kept making posters, and it's uh, progressed over the years. We'll say that. So that's an understatement. <laughs> Tell us how you became involved in doing posters for Bill Graham and the Fillmore. That was a long and illustrious tradition. How did you land in that? Yeah, uh, it it may have been by accident, um, but I was making posters already for a lot of years. I was making political posters mostly uh, with Ron Donovan uh, from the Firehouse, who we've mentioned, and um, we were uh, 
really influenced in a lot of the uh, uh, punk movement, the art that was coming out, the how political it was, the uh, Reagan. Um, I mean, all that stuff was it was it was that time. So that's what we did. Um, we learned how to screen print, and uh, at California College of Arts and Crafts, and we had. Uh, a teacher, Malachias Montoya, who was a, a kind of famous political artist that uh, taught us the craft kind of nicely and uh, the power of images and the fact that you can do stuff with them. And uh, even better, print them yourself. And so this is what we were doing. And uh, Stanley was talking about uh, going to art school, you know, uh, painting shirts on the weekend. We were making political posters during class and printing them on t-shirts and then going out and selling those on the weekend and that's what, that's how we would make our money for our projects and so it got my hands into the world of making posters um uh the previously i'd done a lot of xerox but now i was doing silkscreen and uh i was starting to work with some bands uh you know doing color posters uh and the first one um in the Bay Area, it was uh, Psychofunkopus. It was a local kind of funk band, and I did I did a cover for them that was all day glow and uh, fluorescent. It was kind of '90s, eight, late '80s, '90s, and uh, we screen printed the art, and so that was kind of the start of doing professional rock posters. And it, um, working with a couple friends, and uh, one day I got a call from. Bill Graham presents to come on in. We're interested in having you do a poster. And uh, I went in and I had my portfolio and everything great I'd ever made with me and uh, got into the waiting room. And my my best friend, who I work with all the time, actually my partner in art, we, neither one of us told us, talked about the, this meeting, but we both got called to come in for the same job by two different people, got our art mixed up. And uh, so we ended up, you know, two best friends in the, you know, fighting for the job in the Bill Graham Presents waiting room. And how is this going to work out? And uh, um, it's a long, kind of ugly story, but uh, it worked out nicely for me. I didn't get the job that I wanted that day, but I ended up doing two uh, posters for Bill Graham Presents for New Year's. And so my debut with them was two posters, That's and, which was like about the coolest thing in the world for me. And um, uh, yeah, and then over the course of about 15 years, I made many dozens of other posters for them. And um, before leaving, I think in around two, 2000, I'm not sure, it's six, 2005, six, some, 2007, maybe I stopped working um, with them. That's an interesting time period as well, because one of the things about your art is that you've really embraced digital technology. And I was going to ask you, uh, following up on what both of these other two folks have mentioned about the impact of technology on, on art, how do you see the impact of digitization on poster printing and poster art? Well, it's, it's kind of the computer, you know. Um, the digi digitization, I don't really mind so much, but the, the computer is, is, is an odd thing because it's... Uh, it's really democratized printing, and it's democratized imagery, and it's uh, it's allowed anybody to actually grab an image, throw some type on it, and output it without ever touching it. And so that's really cool, because it opens the door for a lot of people to go out there and express themselves, make some art. They don't have to be professional artists necessarily to make a poster. and. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of problematic because it takes a lot of the craft and the craftsmanship out of, out of, out of making posters. And posters are really two things. Uh, one of them is the image, which could maybe exist in any medium. And the other thing is the physical object, which is, you know, one of these things that's uh, starting to become more obscure in, in, in the modern world where you don't have to touch music, you don't, you know, you don't even need a CD anymore. We, we used to complain when there wasn't albums, but you know, now there's nothing. And uh, so I think maybe the good thing and the bad thing is, is that the computer's the most important tool in my arsenal to manipulate images and to make stuff, but it doesn't actually make anything for me. 
and it's not a magic button. And uh, so um, there's always going to be a need to, to get in there and have craftsmanship and, and handmade artwork, whether, whether it's a collage or whether it's something that's hand illustrated. Um, and ultimately, uh, when you have mediums like silkscreen around, people, people are, are saying, hey, this is, this is not something that's spit out of a four-color machine or that anyone can just push the button for. So it's bringing back the craft and the popularity of the object, which is something I, I actually stand behind and I think is a, a good thing. So. That's great. That leads. That's a perfect segue into my last question for oh. you, which is, how do you see what's happening today with rock poster art fitting into those older traditions, those older art forms? Well, I think it needs to. Uh, the new and the old need to come together, and that's something that I've 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 struggled with my my whole career as an artist. Um, I learned. I learned analog art, and I learned how to do it by hand, and cut film by hand, and to do all the separations by hand. And as soon as I learned that, the computer took over, and right. everything changed. And suddenly, everything I learned, you can push a button, you know. And and so balancing that is uh, is I think going to be the struggle of the future. And um, but maybe moreover than that is. We're going to come into new mediums. Uh, um, to be stuck with a printed poster is, is as the only way to make a poster is, is kind of to limit, limiting yourself in the modern world. And uh, I'm really interested with online posters right now. I, I, I'm not making a lot of them, but I really, really look at all the images out there, especially in the election with Donald Trump. I, I've been really loving how this... Uh, uh, social media and the computer and the internet has really just allowed for almost instant dissemination of in images and ideas, and that is what posters are. So, um, balancing the technique and the craft with 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 that beautiful gift is is what what the future is going to be about. I think, and uh, um, maybe what people are learning posters today are going to have to have to struggle with too. Is that if they're physically making stuff, it's maybe stuck in this space where if you're not physically making stuff, it becomes um, omnipresent almost in the world. It can, be, it can be anywhere. That's great. That's great. Well, thank all three of you. I'd like to finish up with one huge overarching question for all three of you, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you, which is, uh, We've had gallery and museum exhibitions of rock poster art for many, many decades, actually beginning as early as 1966, 67. Uh, yet there seems to be a reluctance on the part of the fine art and the, the art gallery and the museum world to treat rock poster art seriously. And that's true for, I think, uh, it's, it's posed problems for, for scholars and students uh, as well as artists. And I was wondering, it seems as if we're still kind of struggling to, to gain that kind of acceptance and appreciation. And I was wondering uh, if you all see that, and do you see it changing, and just what your thoughts are about that. I absolutely see that. It's, um, uh, the, the, this month is Maker's Month here, here, here at, the muse, um, at the library. And, it's about people making, ma makers, making stuff for yourself. And, and uh, that's a lesson I learned through art, is that um, galleries and museums aren't going to do it for us. And we have to do it ourselves as poster artists. So I'm, I really understand the question. Uh, I, I think the issue sometimes, maybe just very broadly, is that uh, posters have a purpose. Um, they, they, you know, at the root, they're propaganda. So it's it's art for a reason, and that kind of goes away with from the um, 
maybe mainstream conceptual idea of art being for art's sake and not having a purpose, and uh, where it's the idea of something that's more important than the image. Uh, yep. As as image makers, I think we all lean heavily towards image and. Um, uh, having type with that image creates another problem sometimes with the art world. And uh, so the art world tends to be unsure of whether posters, which are, are graphic design, which they're obviously not. Graphic designers really almost can't stand a lot of poster artists because we're too freewheeling. And um, we don't follow rules with, with typography and things. So, um, right, Winston? Yeah. <laughs> rules are made to be broken. <laughs> Rules are meant to be broken. That's how we think about it. And uh, so anyway, posters are a unique kind of mix of all these uh, things. And uh, they, they sometimes don't quite fit this, uh, you know, the accepted definition of what art is supposed to be. And um, we have a lot of competition, too, because I a mean, lot of competition. Uh, the competition being that instead of uh, posters that have traditionally in our last hundred years of society, uh, 20, 20th century, uh, instead of being for socially relevant subjects or, um, you know, civil um, um, societal progress or uh, other kind of noble things, people look at this as now they only want entertainment and uh, a commercial viability. So, you know, something that has to be commercial, so it has to be saleable and marketable. And it has to be entertaining, which is why you know you have Trump and people like that, <laughs> um, rather than someone of substance arguing about difficult questions to solve. And, and uh, posters that can you know the old sa statement of uh, uh, pictures worth ten thousand words or pictures worth a thousand words, it really is true because you can say so much in just one image that. It would take volumes to explain, and I, you know, look at the posters from the um, the Russian Revolution. That that that, as uh, badly as maybe uh, that turned out uh, for uh, communism in, in general, it was a whole lot better than life under the Tsar for several centuries. He, that was even worse, uh, out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, but um, posters. It, also transcend um, legibility. It's like a Charlie Chaplin film that's a silent picture. He was famous all over the world because it didn't matter whether it was translated into French or, you know, Turkish or uh, um, um, Portuguese. Everyone could see it and understand it immediately. And I think the harnessing the power of uh, imagery, like like uh, Stanley and Chris have done throughout their careers has more of an influence over the heart because emotionally we make our decisions, not intellectually. And um, images are, have emotional appeal and uh, a directness that uh, may be harder uh, to get across through um, journalism or uh, other forms of um, uh, communication. But definitely, we're, we're always in competition with the the world that only wants commercial right. uh, imagery yeah. and um, entertainment value. Uh, when you know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Or yeah. sometimes posters actually—I mean, we have to admit—they get co-opted by the music business. And and I mean, there's a type of poster that Winston was talking about, something you just do because you want to, and no one's paying you, no one's asking you to make it. It's, You're, you're making you're making art, and maybe your you're impulse, putting a band's yeah. name on it. But I mean, this is something that you're doing for your own purposes. And uh, on and off, that's become more or less hip over the years. And uh, you know, the the it gets commercialized, it gets taken over, and and um, that can be a problem with art becoming uh, or posters being art and. Right. Uh, you know, oddly, political posters are almost universally accepted as art. So um, it's just the rock posters that there seem to be an issue with. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an odd kind of wrinkle to, to, to watch yeah. in the politicization of, 
of the art world. And Stanley, I think that is something that you have definitely had to embrace as you've sort of navigated and gone back and forth between we, rock poster art and fine art in your own career. When we first started doing posters, um, when the Kelly and Griffin and Moscoso, we, the graph, graphic images were all like really ugly. <laughs> To put it in one word, uh, and we had a f we were fighting to make it b beautiful, and uh, when we f we knew we were doing something because it it wasn't anything really special, but we f we knew that we were doing something special because the the posters got sent to art museums immediately around the world. Uh, I was, I was walking up in 69, I was walking up the stairs in this apartment with my portfolio of posters and Mick Jagger was w walking downstairs. And I said, hey Mick, you want to see my portfolio? And I showed them to him and he looked at him and he said, these are works of love. And I went, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a great note to end on. Let's thank our panel and then let's have a couple of questions from you. Questions, please. Thank you. Uh, it was great, guys. I really appreciate you being here. Um, my question is for Chris. Uh, I wanted to know what those two posters were that you got for Bill Graham. Which what, what, what bands? You said you got those two posters. Okay, and okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, without getting into the story, I, I did the Neville Brothers and I did Tesla. were my first two posters for Bill Graham Present. And the poster I didn't get to do was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And um, it maybe would have been a great debut poster for the Bill Graham series, except the uh, the concert got canceled and it never happened. So it was good luck, so. Oh, um, I would like to ask a question in regards to uh, post art and, and uh, political cartoonists and that kind of thing. Did this country or did this not con this country not kind of like lead the way or set the pace or are we going to be able to ever do that again? I mean, I, I haven't you know really traveled a lot and I didn't see a lot of this stuff from other places. I mean, was is, is this something that we, we were uniquely like kind of like, you know, kind of like really, really like, uh, you know, like really pushing and, and like in the forefront? We, we inherited that from, I mean, there's a long tradition, especially, yeah. you know, early 18th century British political broadsides had an awful lot of, of what became prefigured modern poster iconography. And those guys, you know, the Jacobean printers were always getting busted, always getting in trouble. So I think, I think to some extent, there's, there's just something inherent in the nature of that kind of that kind of imagery, you know, there's something inherently subversive or democratic about it. But it 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 it, it tends to sometimes get political. Um, I I mean I don't I don't think I know a single poster artist that doesn't make political art at some point. There's probably a couple out there, but um, the. Uh, the, 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 the thing with politics that's really interesting right now is that there's, uh, is, is the kind of upsurge of street art um, that's going on that actually goes beyond posters themselves, but uh, posters are a part of it. There's a lot of people doing screen printed political posters that um, Occupy Oakland uh, had some actually quite famous posters generated oh, wow. at it. John yeah. Paul is a uh, John Paul Bale is a uh, local screen printer over um, in the East Bay that you see printing live printing posters at uh, political events. And um, anyway, that that whole thing is exists around the world um, uh, in different forms in different places and. My travels, I've seen it, you know, I've, I've seen various types of setups where, where people do these political stuff and it always tends to mix in with uh, music art and uh, post rock posters and, and other mediums too, actually. In Italy, there were like some pretty hairy posters that were, uh, yeah. uh, if they weren't, you know, elegantly done for the artistic appeal, they were done for the intensity of the cause. Um, yeah. uh, whatever, you know, of the 14 political parties there are in Italy. Uh, and one of the 
the things I first noticed when I moved there in the, in the 1960s, when you'd walk down the street, there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a 12 or 15 of the same poster, either a movie poster or uh, you know, some uh, leftist rally or, or uh, whatever. Um, and I remember wondering, like, why do they put like 20 of them in a row? If you've seen one, you know, you get the point, that's it. But it dawned on me afterward that when people are riding on the bus or in automobiles, but mainly public transport, if it was only one or two, you'd not be able to see it. So they'd put it like movie film, where you have like reel after reel of, uh, and so they'd have a whole block of the same poster, uh, even like in uh, uh, San Lorenzo in Rome. Yeah. And it was so that it would stay in your head because it's like looking at a field of corn. Um, if you just saw one stalk of corn, you know, if you're on the train, it would just go right by. And it was, um, um, I guess, <laughs> I don't even know how, who came up with this, but it was everywhere, especially in towns like Florence or Rome. Um, and it was, had to do with the persistence of memory, how motion pictures work when we mm -hmm. see, uh, you're seeing just one picture at every couple of seconds or several per second. And um, there's no difference between the picture, but it slowly is moving. And uh, that was kind of revelation because they were utilizing this uh, part of our, our visual cortex and the brain that interprets it to the advantage of the, the people making the message on the poster. Um, whereas here in America, the poster is only a single thing to be appreciated as a separate unit. And there, there was a kind of a mechanical, uh, um, uh, I'm not verbally adroit enough to, to, to pick out the words, but there's a, uh, an operation that yeah. was intended to work on passers-by yeah. who were going by at 25 or 30 miles an hour. And you'd yeah. see, da, 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 and they, oh yeah, there's going to be a rally in the Piazza uh, San Cosmo on Saturday. Maybe we should go, you know, because it would sink in. Right. <laughs> that was uh, an interesting variation on the theme. Visual politics, yeah, that's great, that's great. Any other questions? Last question. So I, I know, because I got the inside here, um, I know that the, how the museums have treated you guys over the years, and, and at least your poster work. Would you even consider putting your artwork into like the MoMA right now if they would approach you? Considering how what they think about your oh, you know, that um, work, I'm talking about posters, not like your paintings. Ne next year is a uh, um, summer of love at the De Young Museum, which there'll be a lot of posters in, I'm sure. Yeah, it's you know, let's. Um, I, I don't want to knock knock the museum thing too bad. I mean, they they have, there's a lot of great collections of posters in a lot of great museums. Um, uh, I I think maybe in my experience is what I actually a bunch of us poster artists call it the hometown disadvantage which is a uniquely San Francisco thing um, the farther away you get from San Francisco the more serious they take posters and so if you get as far as to Europe you'll find that the Tate I think you went to the Tate right you, you had a show there or something I, they, they had featured Stanley's art there I know that much um, the, anyway a lot of the big museums will uh, show poster art and show poster artists. Uh, San Francisco, for some reason, and it, it, you know, we've all discussed it, and we think the hometown disadvantage is like, why would the museum put it up on the wall when you can go outside and get one off the <laughs> off the pole? Yeah. And so maybe that's what the issue is it, it, locally. But um, at the same time, we're not celebrating something that's really uniquely San Francisco and very, very much a unique Bay Area tradition. And it, it goes back to the gold rush. We, we've been making posters in, in San Francisco and in the Bay Area and have been kind of a hotbed of it for you know a long time at this point. And it happens here in a way it doesn't happen anywhere else. And um, so, is you know we should celebrate that somehow, and for, if not in the museum, maybe we can do it at the library, right? For you, for years, uh, museums wouldn't touch uh, psychedelic posters because of the drug references. Yeah, that too. Uh, 
in San Diego, they did a, a, a show of um, three other art, historical artists, uh, uh, Toulouse Trek and um, in, in San Francisco artists, and they pulled it off that way. And then, then there was other shows in Denver and stuff. Well, that's a hopeful note to end on. Yeah. Thank our panel very much, and thank you all for coming. Thanks to the library and to the Haight Street Art Center. Sounded good, man. <laughs>